Hello and welcome to the Majlis podcast, Ready for Every Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis and Ready for Every Liberty's media manager here in Washington, D.C. As the U.S. and international troops are leaving Afghanistan, it's unclear what is in store for the country and what they might mean for countries and their immediate neighbors in Central Asia. But when they look across the border, what do they see happening? And what are their immediate concerns? Also, where do the recent speculations about possible U.S. military base in Central Asia factors in in their thinking or possible future positioning with regards to Afghanistan? To discuss all these, I'm joined by Alexander Cooley, the director of Harriman Institute at the Columbia University and the author of Base Politics, Democratic Change in the U.S. Military Overseas. Rafael Pantucci, Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. Salim John Ayub the director of Radio Free Radio Liberty's Tajik service, known as Radio Ozadi, and Bruce Panier, the author of Radio Free Radio Liberty's Central Asia blog, Kishlok Awazi. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today on this very important conversation. So let's start from Tajikistan uh, and Salim Jan. So y- you have uh, sources on the ground. So what's the situation as we speak on the Tajik-Afghan border? The situation at the Tajik-Afghan border more or less calm so far. However, the air uh, and the, the atmosphere around it as for the local villagers and for officials in Dushanbe is uh, full of uh, concern hmm. that what will happen. Since the uh, American forces have been there, it was a kind of sure on that, so everything is okay and nothing will happen and so on. And starting the, the announcement of the withdrawal of U.S. and, and NATO forces, and uh, especially after a lot of news that despite peace negotiations, Taliban is continuing their operation and especially coming closer to the Tajik-Afghan border. Uh, day by day, it's bringing uh, more and more concerns, mm. especially uh, we have news that a lot of Central Asian mm. uh, Taliban or Central Asian jihadists yeah. Yeah. Uh, are concentrating that, that, that's, in, in, that, in the that, city. That's what uh, I had in mind, Salim John. So what, I mean, when you say they are concerned, I mean, you spoke about the concern of local people there are close to the Afghan border and also concerns in Dushanbe. So what are the main concerns of Dushanbe and what are the concerns of people close to the border? Starting from the people close who are living close hmm. close to the border, recently a lot of uh, fighting are happening uh, on the Afghan side, and sometimes even shells uh, affect their life. They are remembering the last days of the uh, Soviet army's presence in Afghanistan, hmm. and the fighting is moving closer to the border. And some villagers are saying that we, we can't sleep uh, at night. Because because of hearing all the bombing, shelling, and uh, f- firing, thing like this, you know, in Dushanbe, of course, they sometimes exaggerate the, the whole uh, danger. Mm. However, s- sometimes they abusing the situation and uh, using it against political freedom, political movement, mm. political activities. However, to, to the some point, uh, they, of course, they concerned about. Uh, what will happen if the Taliban, either uh, Afghan Taliban or Central Asian Taliban, will attack uh, Tajik borders? And we know that recently Taliban asked all the neighbors of Afghanistan do not place uh, uh-huh. American bases on their territory if mm-hmm. they will do it so they can face uh, grave consequences. Yes, yeah, yeah. Certainly we are going to talk about that. I mean, uh, Pakistanis have already been saying that they are not considering to host any U.S military base. So if you exclude Pakistan, the next neighbor is Iran, and Iran is, of course, not an option. The other neighbors are, of course, Central Asia. So we will talk about that a little bit later. Bruce, you also had a recent story about this very topic that we are talking about today. So about the Central Asian concerns, especially concerns by the authorities. What have they been saying recently about 
the situation in Afghanistan. Certainly, you know, there has been a discussion between the Taliban and the U.S. and the Afghan government in terms of peace deals. As we speak, they are not anywhere near to signing any deal that might lead to into any kind of peaceful settlement. There are so many differences. As we speak, discussions are anyway on hold. So we don't know by the September, which is the deadline that all international troops will be out from Afghanistan, whether there will be a deal or not. It's sort of a kind of unknown even for Afghans, uh, you know, when you look into the situation from Kabul, you know, in terms of what future holds for them. So speaking of Central Asians, Bruce, uh, especially the authorities, what they have been talking about Afghanistan lately as the um, international troops continue to uh, withdraw and rumors about the region's rule as the potential host for the U.S. military base grows. Well, I mean, that you know, the governments of the, the three countries that actually border Afghanistan have, are publicly anywhere approaching this very differently. Um, you know, Uzbekistan is by far the most the more open of the countries. You know, their their foreign minister, uh, Kamilov, has been in, engaging with the Taliban. He's met with them in Doha. Uh, Taliban delegation was in Uzbekistan a couple of years ago. You know, and, and of course, their line is that this this should be an Afghan owned peace deal that they uh, that they reach. And, and their Uzbekistan is continuing to develop the infrastructure to connect with Afghanistan. So they seem to be taking a pretty optimistic view that that whatever happens in Afghanistan, some settlement can be reached and and trade, for instance, can go through. But, you know, certainly uh, the Tajik government and Salim John would know better than me about this, but they don't say very much about this. Most of their talk about the Afghan border is fortifying it. Uh, Turkmenistan is always, it, it's kind of a mystery exactly what they're doing, although they did host a Taliban yeah, delegation yeah. earlier this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, so the view of that, just because they're so quiet, you have to think there's a lot of discussions about what this is going to look like. I, I doubt that any of them are going to be happy to think that the Taliban might be their neighbors again. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more so because they're afraid of other, not so much the Taliban, which, you know, historically has been really a nationalist group bent on conquering Afghanistan. But it's the other groups mm-hmm. that are out there. Uh, you know, the Islamic State in Khorasan, Islamic Jihad Union, Jamiat Ansarullah, mm-hmm. people like that who are who have a large uh, contingent of, of Central Asian nationals. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, um, you know, they, they can't be happy with this. You know, I'd, I'd said for years that of all the countries that benefited of the from the U.S., operation in Afghanistan, the, the Central Asians, certainly the ones that bordered Afghanistan, benefited more than just about anybody. I mean, they were extremely concerned about the Taliban in, you know, in the late 1990s, and all of a sudden that threat was removed from their borders. So now they're having to return to that same kind of thinking about what what do we got here? Hmm. Uh, but like I said, publicly, they're keeping keeping their cards real close to the vest at the moment, which makes sense. They don't want to say what their position is and then have to backtrack on that later if events develop in ways that they, they don't wish them to develop. Mm. It's kind of interesting the way Central Asians are treating this, uh, you know, uh, uh, like your neighbor's house is burning and the fire brigade is leaving. Um, before I move on, I also want to take, Alex and Rafael, your takes on the way Central Asian authorities are treating the situation. So what's your reading into their positions? Let's start with Alex first and then Rafael. Well... I mean, I think Bruce's point about timelines and not disclosing is a good one. And I think, you know, the the overwhelming perception in the country now for really more than seven years when the original withdrawal date of 2014 was announced, of course, that was the year that the U.S. left Manas, was a sense that the U.S. was either in the process of withdrawing or uh, would, you know, shortly withdraw. And it created this perception that there was going to be a security vacuum on the horizon that would have to be picked up. At the same time, for different reasons, you saw both Chinese and Russian engagement with the region intensify. You know, the ripple effects of Crimea post-2014, and of course the Chinese Belt and Road, but not just that. So all this to say that Central Asian calculations have to consider really a multiplicity of security threats, regime threats, and partnerships and opportunities. And so this is one big unknown variable as to what the Afghanistan landscape is going to look like. I suppose we can revisit the question of U.S. bases and the kinds of economic and political challenges mm-hmm. um, that would uh, make the region face. But, you know, we'll we'll save that for for the next round of questions. No, sir, we, we are going to talk about that. And, you know, these speculations must mean something. I, I call it speculation because I have not seen any U.S. official coming out and publicly saying that they are looking into Central Asia as the possible location for a future military base that the 
Washington keeps talking about maintaining around Afghanistan. So let's do it uh, shortly after I take uh, Dr. Pantucci's uh, thoughts on Central Asian position about what's going on in Afghanistan and their calculations behind it. So Dr. Pantucci, I guess uh, my question is, what do they see happening in Afghanistan and what are they doing about it? I mean, I think that the uh, points that have been made kind of capture the essence of it already, which is the region appears to be leaning forwards, um, but it's not entirely clear exactly how. I would argue that what they seem to all be doing is trying to develop lots of relationships on the ground. Um, And they're trying to do that in a sort of multifarious number of ways. I think the security threats that they see uh, emanating from Afghanistan, I think Bruce hit exactly right. It's not so much the Taliban who are the concern, but it's who the Taliban might host. And, you know, I'm not sure that anybody really totally buys these Taliban promises of not letting their country be used or their territory be used as a place from which others can sort of operate. I think there's a big fat question mark that sits over the credibility of that sort of statement. And I think everyone in the region sees that. And so I think what everyone's doing, and in Central Asia in particular, you can see this to varying degrees of clarity, Mm -hmm. is engaging with all the various sides. On that point, uh, Rafael, please hold your thoughts. On that point, earlier we were talking talking with Bruce uh, about this very uh, specific question, like, uh, you know, the concern by the Central Asian authorities, as you said, as uh, earlier, Salim John has said, like those uh, militant groups that are spread around on the Afghan side of the Central Asian border who have originally come from Central Asia, you know, uh, their connection with the Taliban is also very interesting. Like, you know, it appears that occasionally Taliban and those groups are engaged in fighting in southern Afghanistan, but in northern Afghanistan, we have seen examples where they work together. And yeah, on some level, Taliban also so far prevented them from doing anything across the border, but Taliban also not crushing them, at least speaking about their presence in northern Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. They, they clearly are there and the Taliban are clearly working with them. So the question is, what are they going to do next? Mm. I mean, the one caveat I would add to all of this is how many incidents have we seen over the past few years in Central Asia of terrorist attacks or large scale incidents that have been linked to Afghanistan, clearly. Mm. And it's not entirely clear to me that there's that many, which is always the kind of big question mark which hangs over all of this. You know, there's, I I know as I think Bruce pointed out back in the 90s, this was, you know, a huge source of concern. And Mm. I was recently doing a little historical research on uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which of course hits its 20th year this year. And if you go back and look at the statements that the leaders were making at the sort of foundation of that organization in 2001, they're screaming about Afghanistan Mm. as their major concern. Mm. Um, And that's because in the 90s, we saw a number of attacks and incidents across the border, which clearly came there. But since that moment, we really haven't seen that much. So in a way, I think that's probably what's feeding this certain uncertainty we're seeing from the Central Asians, which is they're aware of the potential concern that could emanate from across the border. And they can see all the reasons why it could be there. But it hasn't materialized necessarily mm-hmm. in the way that everyone might have expected over the past few years. Mm-hmm. And so the question is, why is that? And is that going to hold going forwards? Or do they need to do something else to beef it up? And I think the differing responses we've seen reflect that, where we see the Turkmen openly engaging with the Taliban. Mm-hmm. We see the Uzbeks doing a lot of this sort of economic connectivity back and forth. And the Tajiks, uh, we don't really know, frankly. Mm-hmm. But one suspects there's an element of engagement, um, an element of trying to get others to help them build up their border defenses. So mm-hmm. I think we can see that there's a level of uncertainty there, and I'm not sure they exactly know what's going to happen, mm. because what I think they were expecting to happen hasn't really been happening so far. Yeah. Uh, Salim Jan, the other day I have seen the Lavrov's uh, comments about, I mean, again, what Russia says about the border is sometimes a little bit exaggerated, but again, he was talking, perhaps hyping up the potential spill over cross-border tension when the U.S. troops will leave or the international troops will leave Afghanistan. In addition to that, I think in uh, in last few days, there was also a meeting of some sort with the participation of regional defense chiefs. I am not sure what was the nature of that discussion. I guess what I'm trying to refer is perhaps was the meeting of defense minister of countries which are member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, I guess, what they were talking about there. I'm sure that Afghanistan was on their agenda. The meeting of Mr. Lavrov and Tajik uh, counterpart, and in the meeting of uh, defense ministers uh, a month before, yeah, Afghanistan was on the, the biggest topic. 
And what is interesting, Lavrov was quoting Tajik officials about the concerns of possible spillover of, of the conflict. So, but this type of conversation had been going on for a long time. And especially after 2015, when Tajiks forced the Russian border guard to leave Tajik Afghan border. And since then, using every opportunity, uh, Russians are pointing out to the border and sometimes uh, offering through other the dealers to come back to the border and so on. However, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a political use of the situation. And most probably the next uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting also will, will be devoted to the situation in Afghanistan. And most probably China also will be included in, in this uh, list of the powers who are concerned. However, looking what is going on on the ground for us as a journalist is, is more important than what politicians are saying. Yeah. And what we learned just during the two last months, we received a lot of information that it's true the foreign fighters are somehow gathering in in the north of uh, Afghanistan, especially in Badakhshan region of mm-hmm. Afghanistan. And there was some sources giving names, and we checked the names and the people and found out that everything is real. So, uh, of course, in 1990s, as Bruce pointed out, there were also such concerns and some groups and people like uh, Ansarullah or Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, now we have Islamic movement of Turkestan and so on. However, we think the number of those fighters were not big like we have today. And it's really can be dangerous for, for Tajikistan, especially because of the porous border, because of the will of those Tajiks who are joined Ansoro law, especially those who were not able to go to Syria and to Iraq and other places. They went to Afghanistan, Pakistan and joined Ansoro law. And of course, could make something. And and yes, on the deep side, Taliban strongly denies that when we put the question about those people in the in the north and the, their cooperation with the uh, Taliban, Zabiullah Mujahid, the, yeah. the spokesman of Taliban, strongly denied that the, there is no uh, foreign fighters in Badakhshan and mm-hmm. so on. However, mm-hmm. we have a lot of evidence yeah. that uh, there is uh, groups and they have plans and they, of course, they want to do something. And tomorrow, when t- uh, Taliban Taliban came to power or share the power with uh, the current government. We don't know what will happen. And no one knows how they can use them in in, in some unforeseen situation. Yeah. Of course, it's um, lots of uncertainty there. I mean, it, perhaps the lack of clarity in Afghanistan explains the uh, lack of clarity in their positions as to what comes uh, next in Afghanistan. So I'm also kind of interested in, Dr. Pantucci, in your thoughts about what the China is thinking about. I mean, certainly, if we try to compare Afghanistan with the post 9-11, one thing is clear that China got much, much more involved with uh, countries in Central Asia and the immediate neighbor of Afghanistan. And also Chinese position, I, I was looking at the CNN piece the, uh, the other day. It has not been very clear as to what comes in Afghanistan and what they are going to do about it. I mean, earlier, there was a criticism by China that the U.S. is abruptly leaving Afghanistan. And then there was also a hint that they want to play some role in Afghanistan to bring peace to this this country. I mean, uh, what they are seeing in Afghanistan happening as they see U.S. troops are leaving and uh, there is uh, uncertainty emerging mm-hmm. in the country. I mean, I think that Chinese have, you know, where they are now in the world is different to where they were in 2014 and is even more different to where they were in 2002 when everything started or everything recent started. So, you know, their position has changed. And I think what's interesting uh, about the Chinese position at the moment is having talked to contacts in Beijing, they seem quite comfortable with the possibility that the Taliban might come back into some semblance Mm. of power. Mm. It doesn't seem to be something that immensely animates and agitates them. 
What's also noticeable is that there's been a huge uptick in engagement between the Chinese and the government of Afghanistan. And there's rumors that, they, you know, they've been talking about providing more military support. Now, the Chinese have said this a number of times in the past. And every time I've asked Afghan contacts about, you know, well, what actually came through, they said, well, nothing or very little. So we have to wait and see what actually is delivered. But my sense is that the Chinese are kind of bulking up their connections and strengthening some parts of the Afghan government to help sort of establish some stronger connection there. But at the same time, I think they do also seem, you know, to be comfortable with the fact that you may see a situation of relative instability in Afghanistan with the Taliban in a position of power. And I think they think that they prepared themselves for that eventuality. And they've done that through strengthening the borders or their border relationships as well as the physical borders uh, that you know the the tajiks share with afghanistan and the pakistani share with afghanistan so around the corner wakhan corridor they've strengthened everything on all the sides there mm. so i think to some degree they think they've hedged themselves in the direct problems and i think they're basically saying well you know let's see what kind of plays out um their preeminent concern is not as i think people often look to the economic side they're worried about the potential for you know uyghur militants to use Afghanistan Afghanistan as a place from which they could threaten China. And I think they basically tried to find ways of establishing links or buying off or targeting any groups that they think might be supporting Uyghurs on the ground. And we've seen that in a number of countries. The interesting twist to all of this, which I think is the really worrying twist for me, is the fact that we increasingly see Chinese officials referring to the fact that they believe that the Americans are using uh, Uyghurs in Afghanistan as a way, you know, trying to manipulate potential Uyghur networks in Afghanistan to do something against China. And we've seen them say this publicly now a number of times. I mean, this is a rumor I used to hear constantly in Beijing all the time. And, you know, no one really took it very seriously. But you've now got, you know, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and security officials quite openly saying this in, in the media and press. And what worries me about that is I think the Chinese are starting to look at Afghanistan through the lens of their geopolitical mm-hmm. competition with, with the United States. And that really sort of changes the dynamic of how they look at things on the ground and how they're engaging with people. Hmm. Very, very interesting. There's now reported by so many sources that China maintains this little base somewhere in close to Wakhan region in Tajikistan. Has there been any kind of extraordinary activity there taking place in recent days in the context of, you know, U.S. troops are leaving Afghanistan? As far as I've heard, no. But Mm. um, it's difficult, of course, to get Mm. (laughs) accurate and (laughs) current information from Mm. the ground. But my sense is that they've had a presence there where they're how active the presence is at the moment in Afghanistan is not clear. They mm. certainly have that presence in, in Tajikistan. And I think it's really, you know, it's a fairly constant presence on the ground of some, you know, not necessarily huge, but enough to ensure that they have a footprint to be able to sort of have a sense of what's actually going on mm. from their own sources rather than having to rely on others. Yeah, yeah. On, the, on that, uh, other than the regional powers like China in Russia, Central Asia is also apparently talking to, to the U.S. officials. I mean, Ambassador Khalilzad was there in Tajikistan in Uzbekistan, although we could not get like much details in terms of inside of their discussion. Also, earlier, uh, Secretary Blinken was on the phone with the Kazakh in Uzbek forum ministers. So, and um, again, they are not very much clear in terms of the what they are talking about. But the speculation is that the you know a possible U.S. military base in Central Asia might be on the cards. So while. All those speculations are circling around. The Taliban came up with this strong statement warning the neighbors of Afghanistan against such such an idea. So how this complicates Central Asia is positioning towards Afghanistan going forward. Let us continue the discussion talking about these and many other questions very shortly. First, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis podcast, I'm joined by Alexander Kohli, the director of the Harriman Institute at the Columbia University and the author of the Base Politics, Democratic Changes and the U.S. Military Overseas, Rafael Pantucci, Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, Salim John Ayub, the director of Ready Free Free of Liberties, Tajik Service, and Bruce Panier, the editor of Ready Free Free of Liberties, Central Asia, Blog, Kishlok, Owazi. I'm Mohammed Tahir, Ready Free Free of Liberties Media Manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in 
Washington, D.C., and we are discussing the Central Asian perspective of the withdrawal of U.S. and international forces from Afghanistan. So, Alex, we are kind of getting into your territory, a possible U.S. bases in the region. So, as we know, uh, U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by September 11. Washington says that it will continue assisting the Afghan military from the nearby military prisons. That's as far as they can get into specifics, I guess, as far as I can hear. So what they have in mind, Alex, I mean, they are racing against the clock. September 11 is just right in the corner. If they have to have a military base, which could uh, jump into supporting Afghan military against any increased mil- militancy, which is the case at the moment as we speak. So what they have in mind when, when they say that? Uh, I don't know what they have in mind. I'm afraid to, to disappoint you and your listeners. What I can say is we have to distinguish between the operational needs Mm. and desires that the U.S. would have in such a hypothetical new Central Asian base, and then what would be the practical ramifications for having a base? And the hypothetical sounds a lot better, frankly, than the lessons we had from the practical. So, you know, I think it makes sense when you're planning out, okay, you need a jumping off point, preferably near Afghan borders. If the situation were to deteriorate, you could pre-position some troops and some equipment and be in a position to intervene or sort of stabilize. That sounds good in, in theory, but rather in practice, it runs into a number of obstacles, some of which the U.S. dealt with quite intensively throughout its duration in its bases in K2, Karshi, Khanabad, and Uzbekistan until 2005, mm. and in Manas, airport near the capital of Bishkek until 2014, right? So first is, you know, how do you label something a base? And what is a base and what isn't a base? This Mm. isn't just semantics. Mm. Um, This is something that the U.S. struggled mightily with, right? So for instance, for the longest time, it did not include Manas in its overseas base report. Mm. It called it a transit center, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even though everyone Mm. knew it was a base, right? And that was part of the deal that negotiated with Bakiev in 2009 was to rename the the facility. I think the issue, though, is pretty clear. That is, a U.S. military presence necessarily complicates and entangles the U.S. in domestic politics and political economy. That's the clear lesson, that even though the U.S. might just want a parking lot, it might just want a staging post, inevitably basing somewhere forces you to contend with, first and foremost, the nature of that regime. If that regime is engaging in things like authoritarian tendencies, Mm. like pressing journalists or domestic opposition Mm. figures, all of a sudden you have to take a position on that. And the U.S. found it increasingly difficult in the 2000s to maintain this kind of split screen. On the one hand, pursuing strong security cooperation in the battle against the Taliban and affiliates, and on the other hand, condoning the repressive excesses, say, Karimov's Uzbekistan, Mm. or in the case of economic practice, is the cronyism that informed base-related contracting, in particular the fuel contracts mm. at Manas, where every day Manas had to procure three Olympic swimming pool worth of volume of sort of Russian aviation-grade jet fuel. So, so that's the number one um, issue. The second issue that comes up is that even though you might assume that this would be good for the U.S. image, that the U.S. is there in partnership with the country. So the bases themselves became the objects of all sorts of disinformation and rumors. And this Mm. was in the era prior to social media, right? Mm. We know that the top stories in Kyrgyzstan in the 2000s were always base-related stories. And so the incentive was to always generate base-related stories, to take base-related incidents, construct conspiracy theories out of them, rumor-mongering. Now, imagine an era where we have bots and social media troll factories just manufacturing disinformation stories. This isn't a hypothetical. In places like Romania or Bulgaria, uh, base-related rumors are a constant headache for U.S. planners there. Mm. So that part of it would be difficult. Then very finally, the Russians allowed a post-2001 presence. Now you can say it wasn't theirs to give, but um, Putin was supportive against his general staff, if rumors are to believed, um, of the initial deployments. It's 2003 where the Russians start seeing the U.S. basing presence in Central Asia 
as not one aimed at the Afghanistan, but one aimed at spreading its influence around the world. Now, add that to Raf's point, important point, where in the nature of broader U.S.-Chinese competition, Beijing would oppose the basing mm-hmm. presence. And now you would have both Moscow and Beijing completely suspicious of what the U.S. is up to and its real intentions and motives. So for all these three reasons, I think sort of return to a U.S. basing presence, no matter what you would call it, a cooperative security location, a warehouse, an emergency location, whatever it is, would be really, really difficult to do. Add the sort of Taliban warning and pushback. Mm. And I think, you know, in all practical purposes, this is a really tough Mm. political hurdle for any central Asian state to accept. But but as difficult as it might sound, Alex, but if U.S., has to maintain a sort of base or transit center or anywhere where they could intervene into kind of negative trend in Afghanistan. I mean, does does it has any other option than Central Asia? I mean, Pakistan has proved very unreliable. And currently they are saying, you know, it's out of question. We don't host anything like that. In Iran, of course, not possible. So, you know, what you are left with is Central Asia. If U.S. has to have a base, it looks like Central Asia seems to be an option. Maybe U.S. don't need a base. I don't know. Is that an option? Yeah, I mean, I think there's all sorts of contingency plans. I mean, you could um, supposedly stage troops and operations out of the Gulf bases, right? Um, mm. So after the, also after the withdrawal from Manas, um, a lot of the transit logistics was going via Romania, right? So, I mean, there are ways. They're just less convenient and less practical. You know, to all intents and purposes, I don't know what the panel thinks. To me, Uzbekistan is the only realistic option here. And that's because... You know, Tajikistan's a member of the CSDO. I think the U.S. has absolutely no desire to get entangled with Kyrgyzstan again, especially given the volatile nature of the government there. And also, Uzbekistan isn't a member of the CSTO, yeah. so wouldn't have those prohibitions. Hmm. Less Russian sway and influence, you know, a significant border and real capacity on the security front, right? Hmm. As well as this kind of global orientation Again, though, it's going to come with a lot of baggage for the Uzbek government if they were to sort of sign up on it. And to me, it's not clear what effect or what impact the U.S. military presence in Uzbekistan would have. Um, there were a lot of arguments, for instance, that were made even post K2 about how, you know, the Northern Distribution Network reengaging with Uzbekistan would spur entrepreneurial activity in Uzbekistan, the whole region. It turned out not to be true, right? Instead, mm. we just had tariff hikes and transit fees. And, you know, money going to politically connected trucking and rail companies. So to me, that's the only open question. I just don't see it happening in any of these places, certainly these places where Russia has significant Mm -hmm. influence, as is the case in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Then then what's the what's the trick, Alex, behind keeping it kind of way? I mean, why the Pentagon spokesperson or maybe why not the State Department just coming out and saying, you know, Central Asia is not what we are considering? Because I think ideally they would like a base. Right. Mm. But, you know, let's we're, we're 20 years on since we established them. And so I don't think necessarily that there's that long and deep of an institutional memory of what was happening in the mm. region necessarily. Mm. So on paper, it looks good. It makes sense to want to set up these deals. Mm. And certainly there are different messages that are heard in military to military context. And there are at the foreign ministry level um, when geopolitics intervene. I just think that if you really start digging into the lessons and the record of the area, Mm. you know, again, I I just don't see it uh, happening. But, you know, maybe, you know, in two weeks, they'll announce it and I'll I'll be back to apologize to you and and your (laughs) listeners. But um. Uh okay, let's let's see how it goes. But uh, so, uh, Bruce, on the possible U.S. military presence in Central Asia, uh, as far as I can tell, Central Asian leaders are also silent or very weak about it. Um, If they don't like this idea, why they don't kill this speculation for once and forever? You know, again, this is not something that any of them are going to be anxious to to speak about publicly or at length. Uh, You know, it's a hot topic. And and, and for their own populations, um, there's going to be a lot of resistance to the idea that uh, there would be a U.S. base on their territory. I agree with Alex that really, you know, the one we're probably looking at is Uzbekistan. But but for all the Central Asians, there's a lot of things they have to take into consideration here. You know, what happened in Iraq when the U.S. pulled out has got to be on the minds of of everyone. Hmm. You know, I I mean, the the scenario that appears most likely is that Afghanistan is headed back towards civil war for a protracted period. And uh, we know that that in these kind of states where there is no central control, uh, you know, it's fertile ground for, um, you know, uh, militant groups of, of various uh, Ill branches and stuff to take root and, and find safe haven. You know, and that's that's not what they want. 
So there, there would uh, you can see where on the one hand they might lean toward the idea of cooperation with the U.S. as being something of a, a bulwark against uh, chaos that that is likely to be breaking out in Afghanistan. You know, and it seems like the Taliban are probably you talked earlier about the cooperation that they had with with some of these groups, ISK and people like that, and we've talked about it. Uh, other people have talked about it during this too. That might be actually the Taliban bulwark against the U.S. having bases in Central Asia mm. too. Is that uh, you remember the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, of course, the Taliban were in power and the Central Asian governments were very hostile to the Taliban in the late 1990s. But when the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan appeared, you know, the Taliban seemed more than pleased with the fact that they could base these guys in Afghanistan and let them loose into the Tajik mountains and into Kyrgyzstan and even parts of eastern Uzbekistan. And it preoccupied the government and diverted their attention from the Taliban because they had their own problems to worry about on their own territory all of a sudden. This might be prepositioning on that, too. You know, Alex mentioned, and I'll agree that semantics is the wrong word to use here, but what, what kind of footprint would a U.S. base have, too? That's that's another big question mm-hmm. here. Now, if we're talking about drone bases and special forces, uh, you know, I mean, e- even in Yemen, for instance, the U.S. had very small operation that ran drones. If it's something very, very small and hard to see, then it might be more acceptable to them, you know, as opposed to K2 or mm-hmm. Manas, which mm-hmm. was very visible. You can you can hide these kind of very small operations uh, you know, and Salim John could tell you too. Mahmoud Tudeberdiev, who was a renegade Tajik colonel, had a base in Uzbekistan that the, the Tajiks knew was there somewhere. Uh, but it was very hard to track him down, you know. And uh, and I think this would be something anyway that the U.S. would probably consider as as a viable option if they were actually going to do bases and something that the government like Uzbekistan might actually agree to at the same time is a very very small, difficult to see presence that was you know limited to. The small-scale operations in support of the Afghan military. When you were talking, Bruce, I was also thinking about in terms of the the need to have a U.S. base in Central Asia back in post-9-11 that I'm talking about. The reason why those bases were created in the first place then also through today in Afghanistan, isn't it? I mean, things doesn't seem to be very much different in Afghanistan. The type of threats that we are talking about, isn't it? Well, there are some similarities, mm. you know, that that's sure. Like I said, I think I think the biggest difference is the Central Asian government's attitude toward, or at least some of them, their attitude mm. toward the, the Taliban is, is a little different than it was. I think they're more hopeful that they might be able to come to some mm. sort of arrangement without having to, uh, you know, actually host U.S. bases. And again, I, I seriously doubt that there would be any big base operations mm. in Central Asia, whatever, if there is a U.S. presence, I think it would be very small and very mm. hard to detect, mm. you know, and Uzbekistan, again, is a good government for this because they're good at hiding things. But like I said, for them, it's a really unenviable decisions they have to make. And what I'm thinking is, okay, if none of them let the U.S. use any bases uh, and uh, stuff, I'm afraid yeah. that what they'll return to is the proxy thing, you know, mm. where they had, where the Tajiks supported Ahmad Shah Massoud and Uzbekistan supported Abdul Rashid Dostum, you know, and that undercuts the credibility and ability of the central government in Afghanistan to function. Uh, Bruce, do you see that's happening? When are they reaching out like the Central Asian authorities to various sectors in Afghanistan as the possible strategy for the unknown that we are getting into in Afghanistan? Well, those dooms certainly is no stranger to Central Asia. And, you know, the Uzbek government has never cut ties with him. I haven't seen that they've increased their communications with him recently. But, uh, you know, he was hiding out there for a while. Mm. And I'm, I would imagine that the Tajik government is doing the same thing, although, again, mm. there's no evidence to suggest that's true. Uh, although, again, the historical precedent would say that they got to be looking for someone that, that's an ethnic Tajik that's in Kunduz or Badakhshan or, or, or Takar and trying to figure out if they don't have somebody else they can go to. If Because let's face it, the government in Kabul has, has not been able to provide adequate security along northern Afghanistan. We've seen it deteriorate for the last seven or eight years. Uh, So it's clear that they can't provide any guarantees. Uh, up there, no matter what they say. So at that point, do you deal with local actors? You know, and then, like I said, if you are, what effect does that have on your relationship with the Afghan government? And what effect does that mm. have on the credibility of the Afghan government in Kabul? Very interesting. Um, just to very quickly, Selim John, and, and of course, Ahmad Shah Massoud is no more there. So is there any person that Tajikistan is dealing in terms of the non-government actor in the country, like any kind of a ethnic links that they are building? across the border? There is no, no information, hmm. but uh, historically, the Tajikistan supported the Northern Alliance and 
Probably they have some ties to Nur Muhammad Atto or to Dr. Abdullah, but there is no clear information and no evidence. Uh, however, going back to the story about the bases, mm. uh, there was an interesting situation when the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service of Russia, uh, Sergei Narishkin, mm. last week on May 20th, said the, uh, Russia is aware of what country is talking talking about giving place to American bases in Central Asia. He, he didn't name any country, but he said that my advice is that uh, if the country is a member of the Collective Security Treaty, so they sh- shouldn't do this. And the tragic experts said that probably Narishkin is talking about uh, either Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan, because Uzbekistan is not a, a member. member of the Collective Security Treaty. Mm-hmm. So, on the other hand, a lot of things depend on situation, on future development in Afghanistan itself, of course. Mm-hmm. We know that even China and Russia and all the Central Asian countries, they all want security. Mm-hmm. However, Tajikistan, uh, leading by Mr. Rahman, who can make a decision himself and allow uh, any country having a military base inside of Tajikistan or for leaders like him it's uh, again good time to play cards between superpowers between and uh, yeah. uh, simply asking what they can what they can give to to him if if they want not to do this or that thing mm. like this yeah, that was the thinking. Like I was reading a NPR story about this. Uh, maybe Dr. Pantucci, you could jump in here. And in terms of the shared interest or the benefit of having some sort of a, a U.S. presence in Central Asia is also, from Central Asian perspective, kind of a, a win-win situation in a way that they also don't like to see this Chinese influence and Russian influence growing further and getting into the under the influence of China more than they already are. The presence of an any U.S. base in the country certainly is as an option that they could play with in terms of balancing their their, uh, political bargaining with the other regional powers. I mean, this certainly the the worsening situation in Afghanistan is something that they would like to stop this from spilling over to the countries anyway. If U.S. can help in that, why not? Mm. I think that's that's exactly I think the situations would love to have that card to play, you know, to be able to, you know, they talk about the multi-vector diplomacy and fundamentally that's Mm. about trying to be the power in the middle that's sort of balancing between all these big Mm. ones. I think what's different about that now is the level of tension between the United States and Mm. Russia and Mm. China. And I think that Russia will use every lever Mm. in its book to ensure that any CSTO member does not have a US base on its territory. And I think on the flip side of that, I think the SCO will start to play its cards a little bit more aggressively in that regard. I mean, back in 2005, when the US uh, left K2, you know, that was in part under the auspices of declarations under the Shanghai Cooperation Organization that, you know, SEO member states wouldn't host bases on on their territory um, that were potentially threatening the others. So, you know, I think that there's something there which complicates uh, that card being played this time, though I'm certain that the Central Asians would certainly like to try to play it. But I think that the the levels of distrust are so high between Beijing, Washington and Moscow Mm -hmm. that I I even struggle to see Mm -hmm. them coming to any sort of even Mm -hmm. back, you know, secret agreement on Mm -hmm. some of these things. But now the Taliban threat, uh, the Taliban is warning neighboring countries against having any sort of presence in their countries uh, of U.S. uh, forces. After this threat, I mean, is there any rule for Central Asians to play in Afghanistan. I think one thing that's lost oftentimes in these discussions is that there's an assumption that somehow the Taliban threat should lead to common interest amongst the Central Asian states and the great power Hmm. patrons. And that's true on a superficial level, but it's not true on the political level, right? Hmm. And so, for instance, you know, we just heard sort of commentary about Russia. Well, of course, Russia doesn't want a lot of instability, but you know what? A little instability that justifies their presence in places like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan gives them a mission under a CSTO mandate and the ability to turn around and say, look, the U.S. just bungled another thing that they're withdrawing from. That pretty much plays into where Russian foreign policy is right now. RAF talked about you know, some of the other concerns that are seeping into Beijing's calculations about U.S.-Chinese strategic competition. 
that's at the back of their minds. So the fact that there's a Taliban threat, yes, it's important, but it's not go- it's it's one of many factors, hmm. right? And so I think this is what sort of complicates and entangles thing. Yes, all sides should agree that preserving stability is a good thing, but they all believe it to different extents, and they're not necessarily willing to completely trade it off versus other regional and geopolitical goals. Very interesting. Okay, I think we also need to wrap up the discussion very soon. Maybe, uh, Alex, if you have one more minute to, to talk about one last point that I had in mind is, so where your eyes are going to be between now and September 11, when the all troops will will be out in terms of these, what the Central Asia does, how it does, and what are the steps that you will be looking at that they will take? Well, I think, you know, looking at the sort of commentaries amongst neighbors is where I think we'll see some tea leaves. Uh, Bruce is absolutely right that if there's any place that could sort of camouflage a sort of a small facility or drone base, Uzbekistan is it. However, it's becoming increasingly difficult in a disinformation space to do even that, right? We know about most drone braces in places like Africa because word eventually gets out. Of and if course. there's an incentive for Russia and, frankly, China to put a spotlight on this and make a local government uncomfortable, mm-hmm. they'll do it. Yeah. And they'll do it and just then sort of have plausible deniability. So so to me, reading some of these tea leaves from sort of comments made outside of the region might give us some clues. But at the same time, you know, there really is a sense that the deadline itself creates its own momentum and its own pressure as artificial as that is. And so, you know, I I do wonder whether all this will be sorted out by September 11th or whether we'll just sort of defer and get, you know, sort of a series of sort of parses or partial extensions after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooley. I know you need to leave us. You may if you wish to, but uh, thank you very much, Dr. Cooley, for your insightful commentaries. I appreciate it. So um, let me conclude the conversation with brief statements from each of you on the question of what comes next. So where your eyes will be to determine where we are headed in Central Asia in its relationship with the United States in the context of Afghanistan. So let's start with you, Dr. Pantucci, then uh, Bruce and Salim Jan. I'm yet to be persuaded that there really will be a U.S. base in Central Asia. Okay. Everyone I have spoken to uh, on the ground tells me that there has been no particular discussion, mm-hmm. and this is a lot of speculation which is being put out in the media, mostly in the American press. So obviously someone in Washington is sort of pushing this narrative out there for reasons that are not clear to me um but it could just be a kind of you know a, a general way of trying to float some balloons and see what what lands and what's come back so but but i i think that I, I struggle in some ways to see the region becoming the center of whatever comes next i think the u.s is probably going to pull way back deploy some force in the gulf and use that as their over the horizon capability if we look at some of the comments that have come up from very senior american officials recent testimony on the hill and elsewhere you know they will worry about al-qaeda and they will worry about afghanistan but it's not clearly their preeminent concern anymore. And I think that just means that they're going to scale back abruptly. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the degree to which the U.S. might abruptly just say, OK, that's the end of that. We're going off. And I don't think we should. You know, I think sometimes in the region, there's a sense to think that we're so important they can't leave. I wonder about that sometimes. And so mm-hmm. I think that's in some ways where my thinking is on the on the basing question on your second point about how Central Asia is going to play it out. I mean, I think that Uzbekistan is actually the most kind of dynamic and interesting one to watch because they really are leaning into this problem um, in terms of their engagement, in terms of their economic activity on the ground. And I think they're doing things which are, you know, positive uh, in many ways. Um, I suspect they are also strengthening their bilateral relations Mm -hmm. across the border with power brokers there who they can kind of rely on. And I think that will, as Bruce pointed out, complicate their relationship with Kabul. But I think they'll manage it somehow. In some ways, the most, the ones which are probably going to be most dynamic is probably Tajikistan um, and Turkmenistan. But I think Turkmenistan will continue to be kind of a void of information. And so we won't really know what's going on there. But I think Tajikistan will be probably the most dynamic and worrying one because that's the place where we've seen terrorist incidents over the past few years. Hmm. That's the place where we've historically had a connection across the border, which has developed into problems. So I think that's where we're really going to hmm. see potential trouble if there's any coming uh, breaking out. And so that's probably the one which is most, uh, most, uh, well, most worthwhile. Watching out for. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, very, very briefly, um, uh, Salim, John and Bruce, so what you will be watching between now and September 11? Uh, as our experts pointed out, it's difficult to predict. And yes, and it's difficult to say anything because of lack of the full information. Mm. Uh, however, yeah, I will not answer this question directly, but I will tell you that uh, when we posted a question to our Instagram users when, when the news came out, so a lot of users answered uh, Tajikistan, and it was strange to me because in uh, 2001, there was no such a support for the U.S. forces or U.S. bases in Tajikistan. Tajikistan, and probably uh, Rahman at the time thought about uh, uh, this, that he will lose not only the support of Russia, but support of its own people. But today I am seeing that a lot of our users are talking about mm. it, and most probably a lot of people have a kind of disappointment about Russia and about China, so probably affects some of Tajik officials and mm. maybe the Tajik president also. Interesting. Let's see. Indeed, if there is a change in calculation, let's see how it shows up. Um, Bruce, so what you will be watching it? Uh, you know, just to see how much more engaged the Central Asians get in the Afghan peace process and who is willing to speak with the Taliban and try to get such assurances as they can from them. But Uzbekistan has, uh, as already mentioned, been trying to take a part mm. in the Afghan peace mm. process and been trying to be a uh, mediator, some, a middleman, uh, you know, whatever, someone who helps both sides come to the table and, and figure out their own relationship. You know, are they going to up that and, and show even greater interest in, in what's happening in Afghanistan in the coming months? Or um, will Uzbekistan go more along the Tajik model of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, just starting to fortify its borders and, and just get ready to keep the tidal wave from coming over in the future. Um, so that's that'll be what I'm looking at. Mm. I don't like to expand this conversation, but just a kind of last point. Engaging the Taliban from the Uzbekistan's perspective is kind of a tricky game, right? Dostum, the one man that Uzbekistan has worked in the past, the ethnic uh, warlord there and now uh, Marshal uh, Dostum, he hates Taliban. And Uzbekistan kind of getting in bed with Taliban. I don't know what kind of implication it will have in relations between those two in Uzbekistan. Um, let's see how, how things go from here. But with this, uh, we have to unfortunately conclude the conversation. Thank you very much, Bruce Panier, the editor of Radio Free the Liberty Central Asia blog, Kishlog Awazi. Also, big thanks goes to uh, Dr. Rafael Pantucci, Senior Associate Fellow at the Royal United Services Institute, Alexander Kohli, the Director of Harriman Institute at the Columbia University and Salim John Ayubov, the director of Radio Free Radio Liberty's Tajik service, locally known as Radio Azadi. Thank you, colleagues, again for your time in Tats today. And this is from me, Mohammed Tahir, Radio Free Radio Liberty's media manager and host of the Majlis podcast here in Washington, D.C. Until next week, bye bye.